Hello everyone, and thanks for joining my talk. My name is Morten Olsen, and I'm lead environment artist at IO Interactive. Today I'll be talking about substance and how we used it in our prop texturing pipeline on Hitman 2 and Hitman 3, and how we created a material library in Substance Designer that we then applied in Substance Painter. Let's take a look at the agenda for the talk. So what is Hitman? I'll briefly introduce you to the game so you have a better context. The importance of props. I'll talk about why props play a special role in the art of Hitman and why we have so many props. Then we'll dive into our transition from our old pipeline into a substance-based pipeline for texturing. And then we get to the material library, which I think is the core of this talk, where we, uh, we take a look at the, the library that we built and we talk about how we build it and how it works inside Painter. Um, and then finally, we have some, uh, some takeaways or key learnings that I want to share with you. So what is Hitman? Um, very briefly, I can, I can say that it's a third-person stealth game. Uh, you are an assassin, uh, uh, like the world's best assassin, taking down some of the worst people in the world. Um, you get to sneak around a lot in these fancy or interesting and varied environments, you know, using your stealth or using disguises to find your way around unnoticed. Um, you get a chance to get really familiar with, with your environments. That's also why we have a certain emphasis on the environment art in Hitman games. And here you have an overview of the locations that you get to go to, and it's all over the world. It's more than 20 locations of these uh, fully realized vast environments where you have like, outdoor areas and, and multiple indoor areas, tons of rooms. Uh, so some very complex levels with a lot of detail in them. So that's just a basic understanding of what the game offers. And then let's talk about the importance of props. So here you can see a shot from one of our levels, the Berlin nightclub, where it's like this old industrial place where it's, it's very run down and there's remnants of lots of old stuff, lots of graffiti. Um, it's just a nice image of how, you know, a little collection of props and how good that can actually look. Um, but just looking at the environments real quick, you can see that we're not talking about the, the architecture, you know, floors and, and walls and ceilings, that this is uh, about the props. And you can see the props are super important in an image like this. That's all from the, the lights in the ceiling, the pipes, the signs, towel dispensers and, and all this stuff, right? The trash on the floor. That's all from our prop library. Just another room in that industrial area. You can just see how, how it's dressed with all this detail and it really tells a story about what the place is or used to be and what's going on here. Now, this, since it's being used for a nightclub right now, you, know, you can see that there's some sound equipment and wires and recording sign. So it's just so much information derived from the propping in an area. With the right lighting, as you can see here, and a bunch of props, you can have a really beautiful image. Here for something completely different, in the, the, the mansion in England, we have a totally different range of props used. There's so much stuff in here that's need, needed to bring this alive like it is here. A fancy uh, office in a moving train, which you can uh, also experience in the game. So just this, this range of, of uh, different environments with so many props in them can give you kind of an idea of what, what it is we need. So we need a huge prop library to do this. So here I'm going to show you a video of the camera moving through our prop library scene to give you an idea of, of, of how much stuff we have and how much we've needed to build and why it makes sense to come up with a good pipeline to, to texture this stuff. So we just have these, this ocean of props. Of, uh, you know, it's, been, it's been expanding since we started the Hitman trilogy um, years ago and then just added to it for, for each location that we need. We built more props for that. And of course, the more we have, the more we can also reuse and, and remix. And uh, you know, it makes it a lot easier for, to, uh, to create new areas uh, that still feel like they have their very distinct style, um, although it's based on reuse. But yeah, you can just see all this furniture and weird assets. There's AV equipment and pots and pans and anything you can imagine. And now you can see the camera moves up here to give you a bit of an overview of the entire scene. In this scene, we have more than 12,000 assets. It's not all props. You can see there's also some vehicles and there are some architectural elements in here. Um, and some of the props also have size variations and color variations. But as you can see, it's a pretty insane number of assets that we've had to produce. Moving into substance. At the beginning of Hitman 2, after having already done a ton of props for the first Hitman game, we wanted to get into substance. 
it was starting to spread across the entire industry. And some of us had already tried it and really liked it. We wanted to utilize the power that comes with Substance, the proceduralism and flexibility and non-destructive workflows that it offers to speed up texturing and make it more fun and easy for everyone. But how do you introduce this into an established pipeline with a lot of artists? We have a lot of internal artists and we have a lot of studios that we work with. We thought what you need in Substance Painter to work is materials. A great starting point is a good material. So that's why we wanted to have the control to make sure the quality was good, to make sure that they were able to do what they needed to do with uh, the right parameters. And this was, would then create a great starting point for all artists and help keep the quality high and consistent and, and save time. Um, so we created this range of materials, thinking about what type of materials do we need, what can cover uh, the known locations that we're going to build for Hitman 2, uh, and based on experience from what we did with Hitman 1, what are the materials we need. So this is what we came up with. I can just quickly go through uh, these 15 base materials. So of course wood, there's a wood material, and this is just one version of it. It can be tweaked, I'll show you later inside the software, how uh, we have all these parameters to change the, the grain and the type of uh, look and, and wear. And a metal, similarly, it can be changed to different types of metal. So here's a brushed metal, uh, and you can change the aging of it and, and the edge wear and uh, plastic. So it also comes in a few different variations with different micro detail on the surface, uh, but also just wear and tear that's uh, typical to to the material. So that's that's the thing that we did for all these. We kept them, all the parameters for these are kept consistent so that you have a edge wear uh, setting and an overall wear setting. And, and there may be something that's specific to that material, like cracks in this instance. Um, another example, rubber here, and you can see how the edge wear is very typical for rubber. So this really helps define this, this type of surface. Uh, the way that it's getting worn, the way that the imperfections uh, dip into the rubber like this. Clay, marble, porcelain, paper. So we don't have a lot of props to kind of build out of paper, but we have a lot of different files and uh, documents and, and stuff like that. Um, so we actually do use paper quite a bit. And rust, and rust which really goes well of course with metal. So I'll show you how we can uh, set parameters on this to uh, expose the metal underneath to get different looks. Stone also comes in uh, different uh, shapes and forms, uh, and, and there's a lot of settings to control the stone pattern. Waker, so this is a bit of a special case, but we had a lot of furniture in this style, so we thought we um, might as well make one of these. Uh, so you can control the, the, the spacing between the, the lines and, and different patterns, and then there's, there's wear and tear and things like that. Bone, and then fabric. And here's our paint. I added the rust on top of this just for fun. Uh, and you can see how the paint also ha has settings to expose the underlying material. So this, this is actually a metal with a rust layer and then a paint. And the final one is leather. And you can also see how it has a very typical leather wear type. So so the, the wear is it's not just the same for all of these. They, they're built with their own type of, of wear effects. All right, so that's the materials. Let's jump into uh, Substance Painter and take a closer look. So here you can see our uh, base rubber. So that's the rubber material, the same material that I showed you just before, but with some different settings. So uh, let's jump into the settings over here. For example, you'd see uh, specific settings for the rubber pattern here. So right now it has these old grainy lines. Uh, this one called small holes. So I think, let's see if you can see them in different lighting here. So some tiny micro variations. You, we can control the tiling of that so that they're not as tiny and how intense they are. So a lot of this is the controls that let you uh, adjust things so it matches your particular uh, resolution and, and UV layout. So you never know what size things will be on a particular model. So you have to, everything has to be adjustable that way as well as controlling just the look of the surface that you want. Um, so here you have the small holes, long streaks, it's a different type here. Uh, so it's all based on research that, that we did uh, of the different types of materials. So we, we have gathered a lot of reference and seen what types would be uh, useful to have and then made sure that that was incorporated into the designer project. So these maybe tile these streaks a bit and then turn up some imperfections. So let's see what it takes here. You can see it starts getting a little bit of 
So I guess imperfections are more like almost like manufacturing mistakes or you know little uh, air bubbles, or it could be where it doesn't matter so much. It's more that we have different types of surface variations that we can put in here. And then for each of these categories, there are some tiling options and some masking options that lets us re reduce and uh, enhance some of this stuff. So here, maybe I don't want to mask it so much so that I have more imperfections there. Now this is a lot. And uh, maybe tiling a bit more so they're not as large. And probably reduce intensity. Let's see. All right, let's just try a few things. And then edge wear is a pretty important factor in most of these. So let's see, there's some light, sh light edge wear. We'll turn it up a bit, see what happens. So this is more just brightening of edges. In a in a kind of a, a, a uneven pattern that kind of matches the the style of the material, and then we have the heavy edge wear. Let's turn this up. Then we get more of that deep deep cuts into the underlying uh, rubber. So let's get a lot of that here. So here we go. Now it's starting to get more interesting. So then th this way you can kind of find your desired style of your material. Um, and very easily without going and finding other materials online or uh, you know setting it up from scratch there's some quick settings here uh, and once you're familiar with this way of adjusting the materials it can be really fast and then of course you can save out presets whenever you have something you like so it's very easy to get back to something uh, you probably have your favorite settings for a lot of the stuff okay so this this is the, the metal so a metal setup with the, I'll, and I'll show you how it has layered rust and, and paint on top as well. As you can see down here, I have my metal and right now I've hidden the rust and the paint. I'll, I'll introduce that uh, step by step. But let's start with a metal. So here we have a nice shiny metal with a bit of brushed metal look. Um, so we could change that, that the style to a hammered metal. You know, turn on the, uh, turn up the intensity of that this one is one of the slow ones, unfortunately, but you can see how this works. So yeah, getting some hammered, and then if you want this to be old and rough, it's probably a little too shiny. And then surface age, we can age it up a bit. You know, we don't want too pure metals. So maybe a lot of age with no normal. Okay, so now, Let's not spend too much time on the metal because it's going to be underneath a layer of rust. So here we have our rust material and the rust and the paint. And we actually also have a dirt uh, that's made this way with a uh, formation build up. So uh, activate rust formation is on. And then if, you t if I turn it off, we're just going to get like a flat layer of rust and, and the edge wear will just reveal the underlying material which might be fine just f uh, f in some cases but if you just want to kind of uh, add a bit of rust or splatter some rust on a surface you activate the formation and then you have to start choosing where you want it edge formation intensity get some light out there you can see we have now rust along the edges there and we might want some scratches so it's like it's been building up wherever the metal has been scratched droplets formation and we have a spray formation or sprinkled on there and so you can mix and match this to get the, the look that you want and again uh, like I mentioned before it's all based on researching these materials quite intensively and finding uh, examples of, of how rust can spread on a surface and where it would typically go and then trying to mimic that in the designer uh, setup let's see patches is the, the big one where we get like some large or well, I guess depending on the tiling and the masking, you can get some large chunks here. So you can see again with all of these, we have we tiling options and we have masking options, so that you can really control how much you get and uh, how the distribution is. So here now we have a lot of rust. Maybe that was a bit too much. So let's turn some of this down. And then rust bleed is quite interesting. Oh, we have a little bit already. There you go. The kind of blends in it, it in a little bit more. Okay, so now we have that, and then let's add the paint on top. So I'm just gonna activate my paint layer here. So that's a, a third one on this stack. So the paint on top, and you can see how the paint has edge wear 
that then reveals the underlying metal and rust. And the paint itself has a lot of, a lot of other uh, features, like uh, rust bubbles. But yeah, so this way we can control all this, really fine tune it. And it and you can see like you can spend a lot of time so fine tuning it, but once you know what you're doing and you already have some presets, I, it's super fast to uh, to just build surfaces like this. Okay, so here we are inside Substance Designer, where the actual work takes place, uh, the work of creating these base materials. So as you can see, this can look a little scary, so it's not for everyone to, to create advanced networks like these, but it's actually not as bad as it looks. This is the base material for rubber, and you can see that it's, it's very nicely organized. Everything is framed and named, so this, I would say, is definitely a must if you want to build anything of this size in here. It's pretty easy to find out where anything comes from, like if you wanted to uh, look at the color options or uh, the, the overall wear or the heavy edge wear, you know exactly where to go in and adjust and, and fix stuff if there's anything wrong. Of course, a node network like this tends to get a little slow. So that's why I also mentioned earlier, if you do anything similar, pay attention to the performance of your graph. And of course, you could also argue that this might be too much in one node or in, in one material, since you're constantly having to battle that performance versus uh, ease of use or you know responsiveness. But it's just, we decided at the time when we made these that it was easier to have everything in one material and use fewer materials and not have too many materials to maintain. So there's lots of pros and cons to doing this. Um, and I, I think it worked out. I think it could also be optimized quite a bit more. Let's just see a few a few comments other than keeping your setups tidy, even though it looks like a mess from afar. If, if, you, if you know anything about Substance Designer, this is kind of as clean as it gets. Like nice framing, things are spread out nicely. It's easy to find your way around. And then the parameters is hugely important. Like the structure behind the exposed variables, grouping them nicely so that you can find your way. If you saw how I did it in Inside Painter before, uh, there's like uh, the surface parameters options uh, with subcategories for pattern and surface imperfections and light edge wear. You know, so you have your, uh, your labels and your groups and your identifier. So using this and making sure that it's all placed in a nice order it makes it so much easier to use and of course if you just started from one end and built say 10 base materials it would probably be a mess and they'd be very different if you didn't have a proper structure when you started so what we did when we started this was doing paper designs of all of this um, let me just drag in one of the early designs for Oh, well, the actual design for th for this rubber graph. So uh, everything has been defined. What inputs does it need? What out what should it output? There's an overview of the exposed parameters. So we uh, we have a name for them. We've chosen if it's a slider or color picker just to make it very clear what's going on. Um, so first you can see the structure that we then had to uh, create in Designer. And then a further, further down we have uh, the details for each of these, so that uh, that's also where the references come in. So we describe what is the color variation, how is it intended to be used, and what does it look like, and then try and mimic that in Designer. So this is super important, I think, and, and, and it would be really difficult to start this work without having a, something to go from like this. Okay, so to round things off, I think it makes sense to show what it looks like when we actually use these materials on a prop inside Substance Painter. So here we have a tractor tire asset that has been prepared uh, with a, a low and a high res model and a bake. So here you can see it's uh, just with its normal map and uh, no materials added yet. And let's just uh, break it down so you can see how simple it is with our base materials. So at the base of this pile here or this stack, we have a, our IOI base rubber. So that's a rubber material that we've been looking at before. Um, and here you can see it just adds a really nice base. So it's not the final thing, but it's the base. Um, and you can see how we're utilizing the cracks here and, and some edge wear and, and just overall wear that, that we looked at. So if you remember, um, 
all the settings here, the color variations, the, 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 the pattern, um, surface imperfections, all this stuff. So that's been tweaked. And, um, and then on top of the rubber, we just have our dirt applied. And, uh, and, and we have another one, I haven't talked about this yet, but it's uh, our, our IOI finish. Um, it just adds an, uh, more grunge. I can just quickly show you here. There's some grunge control, some dust levels, uh, spots, different, different things that's just adding, uh, adding an, uh, another layer of dirt. And then the rest is just uh, smart masks and, and fill layers pretty much. We have a uh, darkening here of the cavities. Then a little, a little detail to break up the surface of the, 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 the tire. We have this ring. And then a layer of brightening, uh, also based on, on cavity information with smart masks. And that's it. Um, and then for the, the center here, if we just switch to the texture set for the metal, we can see how it starts with a, a rust layer and another rust layer. So these are all our base materials, of course. Uh, so the second layer is uh, is using that uh, rust build up uh, feature where it has opacity. So it's kind of mixing in two layers to get it some extra depth. Um, next one is the paint that is then applied on top using scratches, scratches and, and edge wear to reveal the rust underneath. Then there's a, a dust layer on top. And, and all of this you can see here was actually a, a smart material that I just applied. So I didn't actually build all these four. This time I just dragged them in and, and there you go. And then we have a layer of dirt on top of that. And then again, just using uh, smart masks and, and fill layers to add a bit of uh, uh, darkening and slight brightness. And, and that's all. So with a few clicks of a button, pretty much, you can texture a, a full asset like this in a, a matter of, uh, we'll say half an hour if you're starting and, and, and you have some some presets maybe, but you have to tweak a bit. Um, and then you can see you have this nicely defined rubber surface. You have the nice metal with rust underneath. And also looking at it from the other side here, you can see how that that metal and the thickness of the paint and, and, uh, and how it cracks. It looks pretty good. And to do all this, in our uh, old pipeline without substance where you had to go and, and do all kinds of masking in Photoshop and you know building up your material from scratch. Um, maybe you'd spend an entire day texturing this instead of uh, half an hour. So it's, a, it's a definitely a big win for us. Okay, so uh, we're almost at the end, but uh, before we're done, I have a few uh, key takeaways or uh, things we've learned that I wanna share with you. Um, so the first one is keep it light. And that's, you know, with any system or, or, or method you introduce into your, uh, your pipeline, I think it just makes sense to not make it overly complex. And when we investigated uh, our approach to, uh, to integrating substance and, uh, and before we started all this whole material library, we looked at different options of, of how much we could automate the, the, the process. Um, and there was already some things shared in, the, in talks available online of, of more complex systems that did a lot more of the work for you. If you, if you just fed it the geometry and, and the bakes, it could do more advanced things. Um, systems like that are very hard to make, of course. That's one thing. Um, but it's, it's also, it can also become very rigid, where I think the approach that we went for is simpler. It's, we, we just provided this base, you know, so the base materials that we use, uh, for all our artists to start their work from, to give them a, a starting point really quickly, to keep things unified, like style-wise, um, and just keep like a nice consistent quality, quality to everything. But we still opened it up so that whatever you want to do in Painter, you can do, right? So embellish the materials, uh, you know, uh, improve on everything, uh, everything that you get from the materials. With, with all the, the cool tricks that you can do in Painter, or add more layers, add more uh, masks and all that. And of course the software has also improved since we made these. So some of the things you we do in the materials, maybe you prefer to do that with uh, some of the new uh, smart masks or, or similar. Um, but a light approach that also caters to the artistic mind, just to keep art artists free 
uh, and not have it to uh, be uh, too restraining uh, or too technically uh, advanced. Uh, I think that worked out really well for us. Um, the next one is consider performance. So that's been our, the main thing that we've been worried about during this process and have had some issues with is uh, slow performance in, in Painter. You know, if, the, if the, the materials that we make in Designer are too complex, it of course slows them down. And sometimes when you uh, want to adjust the sliders, it takes a little while before you see the results. And it only has to take you know, a couple of seconds or a second sometimes, depending on what it is, before it becomes annoying and, and you, you stop, you lose kind of the motivation to, to tweak and, and, and play around with it. Um, so that's something, if I, I were, if I were to go back or, and, and take a look at all this again, um, be even more mindful of performance. Of course, we've chosen complexity, complexity rather than uh, simplicity in our approach, uh, offering all these adjustments and, and sliders to the artist, which makes the materials extremely powerful and really opens up what you can do with them. But then at the same time, it's at the cost of performance. Um, but, but it can be optimized, choosing the right nodes, knowing what to avoid, like looking into how you keep your networks performant. I think that's, that's something to really look out for. And the last thing before we are done, um, more than just props. And that's, uh, I just want to mention that all this we've been talking about have been around props and the prop pipeline, the texturing of props. But of course, these materials and this approach uh, can be used on all kinds of things other than just props. And these exact materials can easily be used to texture um, uh, trim sheets and, and tileables and you know anything. Um, we, we made sure that it worked well for the way we knew our props were set up usually. But here's an example of a trim sheet um, that's been textured with our base materials. You can see how we layered metal and, and rust and two layers of paint. Uh, and it gives you just the nice edge detail and, and definition that you have and uh, that you get from these materials. Um, so a super quick way of creating, uh, for example, a, a, a trim sheet. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, bye.